The next item of business is a debate on motion 5733 in the name of John Swinney on safe, secure and prosperous, achieving a cyber resilient Scotland. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on John Swinney to speak and move the motion. Deputy First Minister, 12 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As we debate cyber security today, our thoughts are with those affected by the despicable attack in Manchester with the implications for security that is now becoming clear, which was covered in the statement earlier on this afternoon by the First Minister. Uh, what has been re-emphasised over the last few weeks with the cyber attacks against the National Health Service and Monday's attack is that unfortunately we as an open society cannot prevent all harmful, harmful instances occurring. It is simply not possible. Opportunities have been and will unfortunately continue to be exploited by those who have the determination, the will and the capability to do so. What we must do is ensure that we do not let such issues drive us away from living our lives to the fullest and also taking the action that can involve reasonable steps for any government or as individuals to undertake to understand the nature of these attacks and to take reasonable steps to prevent them from occurring. For those in a response role, it is our duty to ensure that our arrangements are such that we can respond effectively to prevent further harm and rigorously pursue those who seek to cause societal harm and to bring them to justice in all circumstances. Our focus in this afternoon's debate recognises the urgency for everyone to secure their technology, data and networks from the many threats that we face and proposes that citizens and organisations must become more resilient aware of the risks and be able to respond and recover quickly from any kind of cyber attack. On the 12th of May, there was a global cyber attack, the impact of which affected the National Health Service across the United Kingdom. The scale and the speed of this attack was unprecedented, and it demonstrates the absolute urgency for everyone to take steps to secure their technology, data and networks from the many threats that we face online. If we are to realise Scotland's full potential in the digital world and the opportunities it offers to our citizens, businesses and organisations, then we must also equally be aware of the new risks this environment presents and be able to respond effectively. The, uh, of course. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. He's quite correct that our response is vital, but so is prevention. Uh, one of the key issues with the recent attack was the the volume of Windows XP installations in the health service. Does the Scottish Government have a target date for removing Windows XP from the, public, uh, from the uh, IT estate across Scottish Government? Deputy First Minister. I think the, the key question that we have to address is how do we establish uh, and maintain the most rigorous level of security possible around all systems that are utilised? That's the key question that has to be answered um, because there may well be in certain uh, circumstances um, uh, an appropriate use for some of the systems that Mr Johnson refers to. But the crucial thing is that the security arrangements have to be in place to ensure that the necessary precautions are taken. And I'll come on to talk in more detail about all of these precautions. But fundamentally, the key point I would say to Mr Johnson is that there is an importance of ensuring that at all stages we take the necessary uh, measures to address this point. And if I look at some of the steps that we do take already, um, uh, clearly our, our policy approach and the requirements we place on organisations are designed to achieve uh, exactly that objective. President Officer, there can be little doubt that the evolution of the internet has been the most significant development of our age. For business, digital transformation is ever present. It has been a game changer, enabling increased efficiency and international reach, expanding markets, capabilities and opportunities. It has been and will continue to be a true innovative force driving economic development and prosperity. Never before has data had such a value and in its digital form its availability, integrity and security is critical to all businesses. Criminal exploitation of the internet is also growing rapidly. Data is the target and businesses and citizens have lots of that data. Unlike physical risks, cyber risks are much harder to grasp as criminals exploit both systems and human vulnerabilities. Business leaders must be prepared for the cyber threat and, more importantly, must ensure their organisations take all steps possible to mitigate that threat. We are used to managing risk in the digital age. However, we must also consider the cyber threat as another business risk. 
Any business that successfully can demonstrate that it has taken steps to protect its own and its customers' data, as well as respond to and bounce back from any cyber attack, is in a strong position to grow in the digital age. Organisations that can demonstrate their resilience to cybercrime can gain both a competitive advantage and increased consumer confidence. And so developing cyber resilience as a core part of an organisation's business strategy will ensure that it continues to take full advantage of the internet age and flourish into the bargain. I'm pleased to say that the Scottish Government and its partners are working together to build a strong and cyber resilient Scotland. We are taking action to ensure that we are adequately prepared. But I want to be clear with Parliament, this is not something that government can do alone. This is also the responsibility of individuals and organisations who need to take the necessary steps to ensure that they keep safe and secure online. It has been widely commented that 80% of cyber crime is indiscriminate and can, be, and can be prevented by getting the basics right. This includes keeping software up to date, using proper antivirus software and making regular system backups. These are simple measures that all users can and should take. Often our technical defences are robust, but are overcome by the inadvertent actions of an individual, clicking on a link to a seemingly genuine looking website or an infection potentially caused by opening attachments. Social engineering is one of the simplest ways of overcoming our technical defences. We should not blame users. They are not the weakest link, as has often been said. They are our essential assets. Links and attachments are common in the workplace, and that's why they are exploited. Part of our response must therefore be to get the basics of online security correct, and this includes raising the knowledge level and the awareness of all of our citizens to the risks and the steps that they can take to reduce this. As we have learnt from recent events, swift action in coordination and sharing information limited the impact of the NHS ransomware attack. However, we must also reflect upon this incident, identify the lessons, and more importantly, share these lessons with our partners so that we can help each other to put in place the appropriate and effective measures to combat cyber crime. President Officer, since I published Safe, Secure and Prosperous, a Cyber Resilience Strategy for Scotland back in November 2015, the Scottish Government has committed to providing strong leadership and direction to help our individuals, businesses and organisations make the most of the online world. We've laid the foundations to make Scotland a cyber resilient country. We've achieved much already by focusing delivery on key strategic priorities of leadership and partnership, awareness raising, education skills and professional development and research and innovation. Let me outline to Parliament some of the focus of our work to date. Of course. Dean Lockhart. Th th thank you very much. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary agree that additional availability of teaching uh, computing skills at all levels of school would help address some of these issues? Deputy First Minister. Obviously, uh, computing science is an integral part of the curriculum and it's part of um, education in uh, some of the early stages of uh, primary education. I've seen uh, various coding initiatives in primary schools involving primary three, primary four pupils. So um, I'm firmly supportive of the importance of ensuring young people at the earliest possible ages are exposed to education on computing and able to uh, acquire the skills and attributes that are necessary um, for them to prosper. Um, I, let me set out to Parliament some of the focus of the work that's been undertaken as part of the government strategy that was launched in November 2015. Um, firstly, as part of the leadership effort, we established the National Cyber Resilience Leaders Board in September 2016 to drive forward and implement the strategy across Scotland. That board is led by Hugh Aitken, the director of CBI Scotland, and the board is made up of key leaders from across the public, private and third sectors who are providing strategic direction across all of our sectors. Secondly, the Digital Scotland Business Excellence Partnership has provided £400,000 to help businesses in Scotland improve their cyber resilience and work towards achieving the cyber essential standard. We focused efforts on raising awareness to cyber risk. Since the beginning of this year, we've developed a joint cyber communications calendar, which has been used by our partners to provide a consistent message across the board. And we're linking closely in this work, and this relates to Mr Green's amendment today, 
with the UK National Cyber Aware Campaign. In terms of learning and skills, we've already built cyber resilience into the curriculum for excellence and are working to embed it within digital skills, as I explained a moment ago to Mr Lockhart. We're also looking at how we can fill the gaps that we currently have in terms of the cybersecurity skills pipeline, particularly around apprenticeships and the qualifications that are on offer. And we're working to build the capacity of cybersecurity research across higher education in Scotland. The University of Edinburgh has recently become an academic centre of excellence in cybersecurity research, uh, acknowledged and endorsed by the National Cybersecurity Centre. So this work has been about ensuring we took early preparations to ensure we were equipped as a country to meet the challenges that we now habitually face. I want to acknowledge the tremendous efforts of our National Health Service staff and the wider public sector in responding to the recent attack that took place and providing assurances around the security of their networks. There was considerable cross-sector engagement uh, during this event and collaboration at this level is an essential element and helps to demonstrate confidence in the public sector's ability to respond to such acts. Um, the investment the government is making in this area is specifically to support the, a range of hardware and software measures to protect the government's ICT systems, infrastructure and data, to improve the government's network and monitoring capabilities, to boost staffing in this area, which is vital to have the skills available to handle these challenges, to establish and expand a cyber security operations centre and corporate education awareness and training uh, right across the board. We recognise that ultimately the focus of our public sector work is really about ensuring that we can gain our citizens' trust and we increasingly move towards digital public services. With that outcome in mind, we've established a cross-public sector group on cyber resilience. This group is made up of technical and business experts from central and local government, from health, procurement, education, academia and the third sector, all of them focused on putting in place the necessary measures to protect the public sector ICT school skills. Um, Presiding officer, it's essential across a range of different areas, whether it's on learning and skills, whether it's on the role of the private sector, whether it's on compliance with the EU general data protection regulation or the securing of our critical infrastructure, that we take efforts in a cohesive and coherent way uh, to ensure that we are equipped to meet these challenges. That is the focus of the government's strategy. That lies at the heart of the approach that we are taking. And we're doing that in an engaged and collaborative way with the private, uh, third and public sectors to ensure that Scotland as a country is able to demonstrate cyber resilience, but is also able to use our cyber capability as a foundation for economic opportunity in the years to come. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Green to speak to and move Amendment 5733.1. Mr Green, eight minutes, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, less than two weeks ago, we witnessed uh, one of the most severe coordinated cyber attacks the world has ever seen. This attack was not isolated to Scotland nor the UK. Our neighbours across the world reported attacks on their IT infrastructure, uh, in some cases crippling their ability to deliver critical public services. On our shores, our NHS electronic network was hit. Doctors could no longer access patients' files. <coughs> the effects were felt as hospitals were asking only urgent cases to come to A&E to ease the pressure on them. Appointments were cancelled, operations were cancelled, GP surgeries unable to access records. The uh, so-called WannaCry ransomware attack also targeted Germany's primary rail link, Deutsche Bahn and Spain's Telefonica. It is estimated that the ransomware attack affected 230,000 computers in over 150 countries. Uh, Europol described this attack as unprecedented in scale. Uh, make no mistake, the events of the 12th of May 2017 highlighted the fragility of public IT infrastructure the world over. So for all the benefits that economic digitalization has brought us, the shift online has opened up an emerging threat from cyber crime and cyber terrorism. Estimates from the Scottish Business Resilience Centre put the cost to the Scottish economy from cybercrime at £393 million in the year 2015-2016. Globally, that figure could be well over half a trillion US dollars per annum. In fact, it's become such a threat that the whole industry in cyber insurance has sprung up in recent years. Now, the Scottish Conservatives will support 
any measures the Scottish Government is taking to increase uh, our resilience against further attacks. Uh, for that reason, we welcome the tone of the Government motion today and will be supporting it uh, this afternoon. Uh, the Scottish Government has made references to cybersecurity in its most recent digital strategy document out this year and also in the previous cyber resilience strategy published in 2015. But in light of recent attacks, we would like more detail on what specific action has been taken to protect public services, utilities and large public net networks, in particular the monetary value of any such investment. Now the UK government has invested heavily in cyber security, last year announcing £2 billion of investment. A new cy uh, national cyber security centre was set up to operate out of London under the control of GCHQ. It is there to assist businesses government bodies and academia across the UK in times of need, including those in Scotland. Uh, at the time, PwC commented, quote, the UK government was leading the way with cyber initiatives uh, that it is putting in place. However, the government cannot protect the UK alone. Businesses must understand the cyber threat their organizations face and take strong protective action themselves, close quote. And that is a really important point I'd like to make today. There is a shared responsibility on all of us to ensure that we are prepared to deal with online threats. Now, our amendment today asks the Scottish Government to ensure that it is having a proactive discussion with UK-wide enforcement and intelligence agencies and government bodies to ensure that a real collaborative approach is in place. I personally will also be liaising with my UK government counterpart on highlighting any areas in the recent Digital Economy Act which pertain to cybercrime and online protection which are relevant to Scotland. But it is clear in the aftermath of the ransomware attack that evidence suggests that several hospitals did not install the updates they had received prior, which left their systems vulnerable. Uh, Daniel Johnson uh, was right to probe into this further uh, today by asking if the Windows XP replacements or updates will take place in our NHS because a coordinated upgrade and end of life plan is a necessary part of any large scale IT project. And the public sector should be no different to any mainstream corporation in that respect. Preparation is everything. The European Commission's 2016 Digital Progress Report highlighted that half of the UK's, uh, sorry, the EU's population access public services via online platforms. And that number surely will only continue to grow. So a crucial pillar in our preparedness is, uh, against attacks is understanding that the threat is truly global. In a digital world, we are not shielded by being an island. A hacker in North Korea can attack a database in North Queensferry. Uh, digital Europe, the digital industry's respected trade body, said recently that cybersecurity is important However, the approach must be centered on better security practices to defeat evolving threats in a global landscape. The digital market is a borderless and a virtual one. It is a workplace like no other, with invisible but tangible threats. Now, the Scottish Conservatives will support the Scottish Government's current cybersecurity plans, but our support is conditional on realistic and measurable plans being put in place. We want the Scottish uh, Parliament to be regularly informed of progress being made. Uh, we want to see close collaboration between all governments and agencies to ensure that a truly UK-wide cybersecurity framework is in place. Uh, we think also that Scotland could lead the charge against global cyber threats and cyber terrorism. And I say that because last week I note that just uh, another major Californian cybersecurity firm uh, uh, announced the office opening in Belfast, creating another 120 new jobs in an already quite buoyant cybersecurity and tech sector in the city. They were attracted to Belfast by Invest NI, who gave a £780,000 grant towards the new venture. Now, Invest NI also recently awarded £5.5 million to Queen's University to help fund a new centre for secure IT, totaling investment in that centre to £38 million. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, Belfast clearly is becoming uh, the world's number one hub for cybersecurity, data analytics, fintech and blockchain technology. 
and the skills, the skills required to fill those newly created posts are being nurtured locally in Queen's and Ulster universities. So whilst I appreciate the good work that is happening in Edinburgh, I also say, why not in Glasgow or in Dundee? There must be more than words of goodwill and lip service paid to Scotland's IT and tech industries. Targeted investment, a bank of suitably skilled workers and a can-do government attitude can and will have a material and positive effect on this industry. It opens up real opportunities for jobs and growth. Cybersecurity is so big in Northern Ireland right now, it has a 0% unemployment rate. So whilst I let that potential sink in, I look forward to hearing the government's response to my comments today and also listening to the rest of the debate. This is an important debate and we simply have to get this right. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Green. I now call Claire Baker to speak to and move amendment 5733.2. Ms Baker, seven minutes, please. Okay, uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, the last few days have been very challenging and distressing for us all, and it is a critical ongoing situation, and it's right that we prioritise and focus on that. And my thoughts are with the families who are all affected by the terrible attack on Monday night. But, President Officer, turning to today's debate, we must ensure we are as safe online as we are offline. And cyber security is an area that can often seem like a different language to many politicians, and it's the same is true for much of the public. And as we heard in the recent debate on keeping children safe online, the internet is central to modern life, and while it brings us many benefits, it also contains many risks. Cyber resilience is an important strategy in protecting against vulnerability for individuals as well as our agencies. The significant change to how we communicate, how we do business, how we create systems has brought considerable risks and we must always be vigilant. As quick and easy as it is for an MSP to send an email to a constituent, it can be just as quick and easy to send malware or to be able to find the one weak spot among millions of lines of code. I appreciate that following the recent ransomware attack on our NHS, the government has been active in helping businesses and organisations, but today's debate does appear reactive rather than proactive. And whilst a specific attack on a specific target is difficult to predict, the threat of that attack is not. And while I appreciate the recent update from the government regarding the extraordinary meeting of the National Cyber Resilience Leaders Board, there is a question to be asked about whether such meetings should always have to be extraordinary. The Scottish Government published their Safe, Secure and Prosperous Cyber Resilience Strategy in 2015. We are now two years into the five-year strategy and this recent attack on the NHS is clearly a setback to the confidence and security of information in our public services. Um, and while I'm inclined to support, I will be supporting the government's motion and I am inclined to support the Conservatives' amendment which welcomes the UK and Scottish Government strategies, I would like to put on record the recent report of the UK Public Accounts Committee of MPs which said that the UK Government needs to raise its game in this area and describes significant skill shortages and the chaotic handling of personal data. And in Scotland we have the well documented problems of I6 at Police Scotland and NHS 24 which do raise questions around confidence and confidence in our infrastructure. But I do appreciate that the government um, has given a commitment to a public sector action plan that will develop a set of guidelines and standards for all public sector bodies. However, as our amendment makes clear, such changes must also see investment to ensure we can withstand future attacks. Improvements in infrastructure, investment in expertise and advice, the capability to build resilience, all of these actions take resources and it is difficult for our public services to prioritise when there's so much pressure on them in terms of their service delivery. Uh, the National Cyber Resilience Leaders Board Action Plan is due to be approved by ministers in June, and I do hope that Parliament will have the opportunity to scrutinise and monitor the implementation of this plan going forward. <coughs> when it comes to cyber attacks, we in Scotland must not stand alone. We need to work across the UK and beyond to understand potential threats, to learn from best practice and to halt attacks as and when they strike. This must begin with the recent attack on our NHS. We must ask why our hospitals and health centres were affected, yet the NHS in Wales was not. Did Wales take better preemptive action? Did the Scottish Government provide adequate instructions regarding cyber security prior to this recent attack? 
and was it given the priority necessary around the Cabinet table? I hope these are issues that can be addressed in the Government's closing remarks. Uh, Presiding Officer, according to the Government strategy, cyber resilience is being able to prepare for, withstand, rapidly recover and learn from deliberate attacks or accidental events in the online world. With the attack on the NHS, we know that Scotland is not yet fully prepared to withstand such attacks. And while it has appeared to recover and deserves credit for that, we must now ensure we are able to learn. The world is increasingly moving online, from socialising to shopping to learning to leisure. The public, the old as well as young, are conducting large parts of their lives online. As local politicians, we know that many high street banks are closing with the argument that most of our transactions are taking place online. This is true for our businesses and organisations, with millions of pounds worth of transactions being transferred online daily. Cybercrime is a threat that we are all aware of, but it is also one that we believe to be underreported. It is one that can be prevented if the right security, the firewalls and precautions are in place. Yet computers, data and personal details are often left inadvertently exposed. Computer systems left wide open in a way that you wouldn't leave unlocked to your front door or the door of your car. Um, and I've actually, as part of the research for this, found out that Britain ranks below Brazil, South Africa and China in terms of keeping phones and laptops secure, which is quite a concerning um, statistic. And around 80% of cybercrime can be prevented if we just get the basics right. So strong passwords, downloading and installing security and crucially their updates, protecting our mobile devices and wireless networks and being aware of suspicious emails often claiming to be from reputable sources. Yet as much as we look towards individuals and businesses to take responsibility, we must ensure that here in Scotland we have the resources to tackle such crimes once they take place. We are currently in the middle of policing 2026 and cyber security is one of the major challenges facing Police Scotland. We need to ensure that the right people are being recruited to fill the right roles. There's a clear need for a balanced workforce in our policing and tackling cyber crime would benefit from this. We need to make sure that the best minds, for example, we know the recent NHS situation was resolved by a self-taught individual. We need to ensure that this kind of person can work with Police Scotland to support our agencies in being cyber resilient and able to avoid and tackle cyber crime. And last year I visited the Scottish Crime Campus in Gartkosh, which is a world leading facility hosting specialist crime fighters. It is proof that what they can be achieved with high quality, highly skilled jobs alongside the right resources. But we know that Police Scotland is facing a significant financial challenge. We need to make sure our public services from the NHS that was attacked earlier this month to Police Scotland all have the proper resources and investments to withstand, prevent and tackle cyber crimes. And finally, partnership is so important. The Scottish Government must work with the UK Government, other devolved assemblies and agencies throughout the UK to ensure here we have the cap capabilities, the knowledge and the resources to keep us all safe and secure online. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I move to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Donald Cameron. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, presiding officer, on the 9th of February 1984, we saw the launch of the first real-time high-value payments uh, system called CHAPS. Uh, I was the project manager for the Bank of Scotland, and we were the first bank that was ready to implement. I well remember our excitement later that year when we made our first real-time irrevocable payment of over a billion pounds. By 2011, the system had processed a quadrillion pounds of transactions. That's a thousand million million pounds, and one followed by 15 zeros. To secure the transactions, I had to gain permission uh, from the US Department of Defense, and sign my life away, to use what was categorized as weapons-grade encryption and digital signing software which operated within a black box, which self-destructed if you attempted to open to examine its contents. So the technology was and is as secure as you could possibly imagine. And the objective today should be that every business and every individual should be in possession of similarly impenetrable security. We do, but 
uh, we don't all choose to implement it. And even if we have, and this is the point uh, I want to address, we don't necessarily use it in a way that allows it to be as secure as we might imagine. Because for the most part, it's not the technology that fails, it's humans who fail. The motion uh, says uh, citizens must be aware of the risks. And John Swinney in his opening remarks said it should be not be government alone. The history of human failure to use secure data systems goes back a very long way. 2,000 years ago, slaves had their heads shaved. Message was written on the scalp, the hair regrew, and the slave was then sent with the message to somewhere else. And that was all and well and good until people realized the method that was being used. Having a secret method provides no real security. Today, that remains true. Indeed, effective data security systems rely on their having been published and scrutinized to confirm that the method is a sound one. What we do need to do is keep the keys secret and to change them frequently. Mary Queen of Scots in the 16th century used a two-cover system to protect her confidential messages. The first was a secure box with two locks, a key for each lock. She held one key, the other key was held by the recipient. Nobody else got access to either key. The message was put in the box, she locked her lock. The box went to the recipient, he used his key and locked his lock. He came back to Mary, Queen of Scots, she unlocked her lock. It went back to the recipient, he unlocked his box. It was a secure system for transmitting a message from A to B in the 16th century. Nobody shared the key or had access to it. The second thing she had, the message in the box, was encrypted using a letter substitution uh, system. But here's where she fell down. She thought the system was totally secure because it was transmitted securely. And when the message came out of the box, she forgot that it was now available to anyone passing to pick up the bit of paper. Queen Elizabeth picked up one of her messages, was able to unscramble the message, and it formed part of the evidence at Mary Queen of Scots trial that caused her to be executed. Data security is quite important. Um, Napoleon had Le Grand Chiffre, the great code. Common letters uh, on the alphabet were not always coded the same, so that you couldn't break it down by analyzing frequency. But encoders started to use some of the spare codes over and over again as place names uh, for where the fighting was, all to save time and effort. And Wellington's code breaker was a guy called Gord George Scoville. And he managed, because of that weak way a good system was used, to break in. And so when you got to the Battle of Waterloo, Wellington knew what Napoleon's plans were. And that led to the end of an empire. Human error, once again. The German Enigma machine that they thought was unbreakable until 1945, actually broken by the Poles in 1932, Bletchley Park broke a later improved version because every day at 6 a.m. the Germans sent a weather forecast out encrypted. The same format every day, the same time every day, and that enabled Bletchley Park to break. Lots of other good things they had to do as well, what should have been a very secure system. Human error. Most of us know how to drive a car, but rather few of us know how the mechanical bits actually work and how to fix them when they fail. So too, we mostly know how to use computer, perhaps even use the security functions that are provided with it. But like a car, if we don't get an expert to service it regularly or to fix it when it fails, disaster looms. All businesses should have regular security checkups. It won't be free, but the cost will be even higher of not doing it. It's like insurance, it's a product you can't buy when you want it. And when your reputation's trashed and your customers are flown, the paying a little bit once a year would seem very cheap indeed. Finally, an example of a security problem in the modern world. I bought, as I usually do, a good quality second-hand car. And all the gadgets, including a Bluetooth connection for my phone. Good technology, but an unaware previous owner of my car had left his entire phone's contact list in the memory of the car. Do you realize you can do that too? I'm a good guy, I deleted it. 
But suppose the chief executive... You're executive... such a good guy that you have to wind up now. Well, Intriguing that... though this is, Mr Stevenson. In, in that case, presiding officer, let me caution chief executives, chairmen of companies, <laughs> don't use Bluetooth in your car unless you know how to delete it from the memory. I'm a good guy. I deleted it. You won't meet everybody as honest and trustworthy as I am. Oh, my goodness, Mr Stevenson. <laughs> I can't wait for your book to come out. Facts you didn't know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, Donald Cameron to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr Cameron, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to refer to my register of interest and in the fact that I'm on the board of two companies which invest in healthcare technology. It's significant that on a day when we are all still digesting the horrific news of a violent and physical, physical attack on our country, we today also debate the need to protect ourselves from cyber attacks. And it was something the uh, Deputy First Minister mentioned. I entirely endorse what he said. While nothing can ever surpass the tragic loss of so many innocent lives that Manchester witnessed, it seems to me that one of the greatest challenges we face as a society is the sheer number and variety of threats which we now must guard against. Our enemies come in many forms, from the deadly and murderous suicide bomber of Monday night to the sophisticated cyber warriors of two weeks ago. The ransomware attack on IT systems which affected some 200,000 computers across 150 different countries was certainly one of the most unprecedented attacks we've ever seen. I'd like to concentrate my comments on the NHS. The fact that our own NHS was attacked is nothing short of spiteful, especially because of the delays to treatment that occurred to patients across the UK and in England in particular. We were relatively lucky in Scotland in that only 1% of electronic devices were affected, and the number of people who required their operations to be rescheduled was minimal. However, the simple fact is that any delay to an operation or appointment or treatment as a result of this attack was frustrating, to say the least. 13 health boards were affected and some GP surgeries. The Cabinet Secretary for Health made a swift statement last week, and I'm grateful for the clear manner in which he presented the known facts, and like her, I welcome that there have been no reports of patient data being compromised. I'd also like to pay tribute to the IT staff in the NHS who worked extraordinarily hard to get all of the affected systems back up and running. As was reported last week, very few people knew how to fix this, but it is testament to those who were able to overcome it that they did so so quickly. I also want to thank our frontline NHS staff who carried on serving the public as normal, even if it meant a lesser reliance on IT systems to do the job. They should all be commended. And the Health Committee heard only yesterday from the Scottish Ambulance Service, who said there had been no operational impact and no loss of patient data during or after the attack. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is plain there are several aspects of the attack that need to be tackled to ensure that attacks in the future can be thwarted as early as possible. Naturally, we can't be expected to prevent every attack. But as our reliance on various forms of IT continues to grow, so too will the likelihood of cyber crime. This cyber attack could have been far, far worse. And it is clear that we need to do more to ensure our IT systems in the NHS are up to date and we can respond to future attacks as effectively as possible. According to the Scottish Business Resilience Centre, cybercrime cost Scotland around £394 million in 2015-16. It's an exceptionally lucrative market for those who know how to code and wish to use their talents to act maliciously. And that's why we need to be on guard. But we also need the people within our NHS and within the wider public and private sector who possess the relevant skills to combat attacks as and when they happen. And this in turn requires people who are able to stress test IT systems on a continual basis so that systems are protected from new viruses and malicious attacks. And I'm sure like others, I received a interesting briefing from the University of Abate on this point, because they said that the defensive cybersecurity is already fairly well established in undergraduate and postgraduate programs at university, with skills such as cryptography and intrusion prevention being taught. But they point out that offensive cybersecurity courses are not as common, and there is a real need to consider investing in that particular avenue. What they say, quite simply, is the best way to catch a thief is to think like a thief. And while it is clear there are major ethical questions which arise, particularly in giving a new generation the skills and abilities to hack maliciously, degree programs like this might help fill a skills vacancy which is all too evident 
across Scotland, Britain and the wider world. Turning back to the NHS, I want to focus on why the issues I've mentioned are particular, per particularly pertinent. We know that many of our NHS health boards continue to use out-of-date IT software, which in many cases can't be updated for fear of having a negative impact on the technology that is currently used to serve and heal patients, such as MRI scanners, for example. That software and that updating needs to be reviewed. Also, the Cabinet Secretary for Health stated last week that she would seek to ascertain whether health boards have regular patching regimes in place. And it would be interesting to understand if this is indeed the case and whether she will report back to Parliament with an update on that at some point in the near future. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is abundantly clear that lessons need to be learnt. Now isn't the time for political posturing on this issue, but for all of us to debate, as we have, the actions that are required to ensure such incidents are dealt with swiftly without causing public fear and panic. We must take every precaution possible to protect one of the most vital public health services, the NHS. Fundamentally, I believe it is long-term solutions that are required for an issue such as this. Short-term fixes simply won't suffice. We need to be constantly aware, and let's learn from this and improve things for the better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Claire Adamson. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We are in this stone age of cyber security. This was the assessment of Dr Christopher Fry, Secretary General of the World Energy Council 12 months ago. He went on to add that real learning will only come after the first major incident and whether uh, the recent global cyber attack will act as a catalyst for that real learning Dr Fry talks about remains to be seen but it's abundantly obvious and as all speakers have already acknowledged this is an area that will demand far greater attention going forward than it is perhaps commanded uh, to date and in that context I very much welcome uh, the opportunity to take part in this debate uh, on creating a cyber resilient Scotland and confirm that Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting uh, the government's motion at decision time today unfortunately due to a funeral back in my constituency I'll be un I unable to stay until the end of the debate and for that I apologise to you Deputy Presiding Officer to the Cabinet Secretary and to MSP colleagues. I think John Swinney's motion makes a number of very important points about the serious threats posed and the need for far greater vigilance on the part of individuals and organisations, points he reinforced in his earlier remarks. And at the same time, I welcome the amendments lodged by both Jamie Green and Claire Baker. These, I think, helpfully reinforce the need to improve the way in which we report and capture the scale of cyber crimes as well as the importance both of building resilience across uh, our public services and ensuring the closest possible working uh, cooperation between UK and Scottish governments and their partners. Without these elements at the core, our collective ambition to create a safe, secure, prosperous and cyber resilient Scotland will inevitably be frustrated. In the brief time available uh, to me this afternoon, Deputy President Officer, I want to concentrate my remarks on these and some related areas. It's perhaps worth acknowledging at the start, however, that there are two types of cyber crimes. Those that use computer software as the tool and the end target for attacks, such as the recent ransomware attack that caused so much disruption, notably across our health services, and I pay tribute to, to those in those health services for their endeavours. There are then cyber-enabled crimes that use computers simply as a conduit for criminal activities that also take place offline, such as identity theft and money laundering. It's safe to say that cyber attacks across the board have been on the increase in recent years and unfortunately will appear somewhere short uh, of being able to assess the true extent and the scale of those attacks. As HMISCS highlighted in its crime audit last year, there is currently no comprehensive data on the extent of cyber-related crime in Scotland. It went on to recommend that Police Scotland develop the ability to tag all incidents and crimes that have a cyber element and assess the demands on policing in Scotland. Since carrying out its audit, HMICS has acknowledged that police officers have now been instructed to tag crime reports with cyber crime markers, but this still doesn't appear to extend to cyber related incidents. Indeed, as recently as November last year, the Justice Secretary acknowledged in a response to a parliamentary question that I'd lodged um, that work is required to improve the evidence base on cybercrime and how such crime is defined, uh, recorded and reported. What is also not clear is the extent to which Police Scotland's failed I-6 programme referred to by Claire Baker is inhibiting the force's ability to track and combat cybercrimes. 
It has certainly deprived Police Scotland of the cost savings promised by ministers at the time of the merger, and that in itself will make more difficult, I think, the task of matching police resources to the scale of the cyber challenge. The Scottish Crime Reporting Board has also been asked to consider the extent to which current crime recording practice adequately captures the scale of cyber-enabled sexual crime and victimisation, particularly for children and young people. It would be helpful if the Justice Secretary, in concluding this debate, might be able to update Parliament in this regard. Meantime, we perhaps need to take care in talking about lower levels of crime overall if we're still unsure about the extent to which there has been a shift online rather than a reduction. Even now, there seems to be enough evidence to suggest something of a displacement effect with all the challenges this presents in terms of identification, uh, recording, investigation, etc. As I said earlier, I think John Swinney is absolutely right to emphasise the need for increased vigilance and care on the part of us as individuals. We all have a responsibility to do what we can to protect ourselves, albeit that some will inevitably need more help in achieving this than others. At the same time, however, the way in which government and public bodies treat personal data and information requires greater care and consideration. Mr Swinney will be aware of the concerns Scottish Liberal Democrats had about the government's recent plans to create a super ID database. Those concerns were shared by independent experts as well as the public. Sacrificing personal data in the interests of administrative efficiency is not acceptable and I very much welcome the recent change of heart. In terms of organisations and businesses, there does seem to be a growing recognition of the importance of this issue. Yet, as the Association of British Insurers point out in their briefing, while awareness levels amongst businesses about cyber security is high, around only half of them have the basic technical controls necessary. Moreover, while preventing such attacks has to be the priority, where they do occur, it's imperative that organisations and businesses have the advice, support and wherewithal to recover as quickly as possible. Not surprisingly, ABI uh, make the case for the benefits of cyber insurance, but I think it's also worth acknowledging, as the government does in its 2015 strategy, that we're fortunate in the UK to have an innovative cyber security goods and services industry, one uh, that can help us meet demand not just here but also globally. For that reason, I hope the government will agree that it's in all our interest to ensure that this sector, alongside the work being done in our world-class research community, is nurtured going forward. Deputy Presiding Officer, in an increasingly digital age, age, our future prosperity depends on our ability individually and collectively to embrace and make the most of the digital technologies. While these technologies open up a bewildering array of opportunities, so too do they expose us to new risks. Uh, present, uh, preventing risk uh, completely is an impossible in the digital arena as it is anywhere else. But we can and must minimise those risks by raising awareness, being vigilant and building resilience. And I welcome the opportunity for Parliament to reinforce that message this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms MacArthur. I call Claire Adamson to follow by Anna Sarwar. Ms Adamson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I declare an interest as a member of the British Computer Society and also associate myself with the comments of my colleagues this afternoon regarding the appalling incident in Manchester this week. Richard Phillips Fenman was an American theoretical physicist known as a pioneer of quantum mechanics, quantum computing, and for introducing the concept of nanotechnology. He was also a Nobel physicist medalist. During his lifetime, Fenman became one of the best known scientists in the world, including being ranked by the British Journal of Physics World as one of the 10 greatest physicists of all time. He assisted in the development of the atomic bomb during World War II and became known to a wide public in the 1980s as a member of the Rogers Commission investigating the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. But as Mr. Feynman's experience in Los Alamos and his early adventures that I would like to highlight today, Fenwin was a joker, a mischief. To pass the time while working on the Manhattan Project, he grew interested in locks and security. And as he was working on perhaps the most sensitive project in human history, he just took it upon himself to probe that security around him. This was a cause of great frustration, annoyance to the great and the good, but he believed he was providing a necessary check to their balances. We might describe him today as a friendly ethical hacker, or I'm sure his bosses described him as something else at the time. The truth is, Richard Feynman didn't understand how to crack safes or crack locks, but he knew how to break a security system at its weakest point, the human element within that security system. 
As the presiding officer will allow me, I'll highlight just a few of the human vulnerabilities that he exposed in his, and he details it in his essay, Safe Cracker, Make Safe Cracker. First of all, he could pick locks. He said that all the secrets of the project, everything about the atomic bomb were kept in filing cabinets, which were locked with three pin padlocks, and he said they were as easy to, as pie to open. So having explored the weaknesses of the first set of filing cabinets, they were replaced. And then Mr. Feynman discovered that the new cabinets, when left open, it was very easy to discover the first two digits of the combination. Indeed, it was easy as pie. And after about two years of practice, he was able to do this within seconds and do it on the safes in the Manhattan in Los Alamos project, which also had the same locking mechanism as some of the filing cabinets. He discovered that when they were left open, you could just go along and take, take out at least the first two digits. But he understand humans as well. And he knew that more often, the combination would be of significance to the person that were there. So having got two digits, he was able to look at, the, at dates in history, significant family dates of the people involved, and guess at the combinations of many of the locks. He also knew that people would write down the codes for the locks. And even if they used a cipher that was almost always used the common mathematical cipher, he could decipher it being a mathematical genius. He also discovered that people frequently used the same combination for different locks. On explaining this to a senior um, military officer while visiting the uranium storage at Oak Ridge, he explained the dangers of leaving the cabinets open and leaving the safe open. He returned a few months later, hoping to see new security put in place to discover that he had been identified as the problem. So Mr. Feynman was no longer allowed to be left alone in a room and he was accompanied at all time, but there was no instruction to keep the cabinets and the safes locked. But his most significant discovery, and one that perturbed him because he thought he had discovered a safe cracker, was when he was asked to come and open a safe that had been left uh, locked by a, a, a military commander who was no longer on site and they needed it opened immediately. And this being his greatest challenge, he was really excited, entered the room to discover that it was opened and had been opened by a technician. Months and months of worry and trying to work out what had happened, discussing things with the chap, trying to get to the bottom of it, eventually all was revealed. The default settings of the safe delivered by the manufacturer had never been changed. And this technician knew what the default setting was. So reused passwords, leaving way into systems unsecured, default settings that are left. And if, if we haven't, anyone who was affected by the phone hacking uh, scandal knows how easily that was um, used just recently. False sense of security when you have that physical safe in the corner or that little tick on your virus software that makes you think that you're um, secure from what's there. Failure to implement the solutions when the threat is revealed. What, what this all tells us is that if we don't understand the threat, we can't protect against it. The British Computer Society have produced a number of um, leaders um, uh, briefings and strategy documents and um, part two of their most recent set is on security and there are five tips and none of them are about computing they are all about humans leadership from the management cyber security policies face-to-face -face delivery of training and a culture of openness that allows people to admit when they have have made mistakes this is a human problem requiring a human solution I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As events this week so tragically demonstrate, there are people who will willfully seek to attack in various ways individuals, communities, our services, and the nation's vital infrastructure. And in the area of cybercrime, it is increasingly apparent that threats and potential threats are becoming ever more organised and sadly effective. What we saw happen 10 days ago was not a random or one off attack on the nation's infrastructure. Rather, it was the result of a predetermined and the determined act by organized forces. 
That is why equally our response and preparedness to deal with these kinds of attacks must also be determined. 11 health boards were affected, as was the Scottish Ambulance Service. It, planned procedures were cancelled. People were asked not to visit A&E unless they needed urgent and immediate action. It, the response from the Scottish Government was swift. I do fear, however, Deputy Presiding Officer, that the response was too late. It, we have been warning the Scottish Government of the need for proper preparedness of Scottish public bodies to the growing threat of cybercrime for some time. In December 2016, Freedom of Information requests found that over half of our NHS boards had received ransomware attacks. At that time, we called for an urgent review of cyber security. Indeed, only as recently as January, there was a similar attack on Scotland's NHS staff with their details being hacked. On the 25th of January, ministers were informed of that attack and data breach. Um, and again, we recalled that demand for a review of cyber security. In actual fact, it goes back to 2010, when my colleague Richard Simpson, who is no longer in this chamber, uh, has been asking questions regularly on cyber security, and indeed specifically on Windows XP, since as far back as 2010. Uh, but despite these questions, uh, there appears little or no action has been taken uh, by the Cabinet Secretary or indeed um, fellow ministers. I think that is quite alarming, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, and I must say it's uh, also disappointing that the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health is not in the chamber today, given this was a direct attack on our NHS infrastructure. Um, a few specific questions that I hope uh, the Deputy, Presiding uh, Deputy First Minister can uh, address, and I'd be happy to take um, any interventions from him if he wants to answer any of those issues directly, because I think it's in all our interest for us uh, to get this right. First, why was the NHS in Scotland adversely affected uh, by the recent cyber attacks, but the NHS in Wales uh, was not? Uh, why do we still have antiquated computer systems in our public sector uh, infrastructure when we wouldn't expect to have those antiquated systems either in our homes, uh, in our parliamentary offices, or indeed in this uh, parliamentary chamber um, itself? Why was preemptive action not taken, um, as was done in similar uh, places, for example, in Wales that help prevent uh, the cyber attacks? Uh, what specific warnings or advice has the Cabinet Secretary issued to NHS Scotland to ensure that adequate resilience against cyber attacks is in place? Uh, when was any such advice given? And if that advice was given, uh, will the Cabinet Secretary publish that advice as it would be welcome for other institutions who may also face similar attacks? Uh, what additional resources have been allocated by the Scottish Government in 2016-17 to specifically improve and secure against cyber attacks, not just to NHS Scotland, but actually to all Scottish Government departments and all other agencies and organisations for which the Scottish Government has responsibility. Um, it's also interesting to note if any agency or department for which the Scottish Government has responsibility has ever paid any ransom at any time to those responsible for ransomware attacks and what advice the Scottish Government has issued on the required response to ransom demands from those responsible for cyber attacks, and again, if that advice it would be published. Because, Presiding Officer, I think it's clear for all to see that this attack could either have been prevented or indeed could have been less destructive if we had been both better prepared and better resourced. And I think the last 10 days have acted as a, as a wake-up call to all of us in terms of making that happen. Um, I welcome the fact that the um, government has said that they will develop a set of standards uh, of, and guidelines, uh, but I do say with regret that by 2018 isn't ambitious enough. I think surely we can all do better uh, than that. These are immediate attacks that are affecting um, our institutions right now, and I think uh, waiting 18 months to be able to set out those robust guidelines and standards uh, I think is too long. So again, I hope that's an issue that the Deputy First Minister can address um, in his closing remarks. In its first three months, the National Cyber Security Chief Executive Office reported that the centre had handled 188 high-level cyber attacks. Um, it's been reported that they blocked 34,550 potential attacks uh, on government departments and members of the public in the past six months alone. That's 200 cases a day. 200 cases a day. I don't think we should be waiting 18 months to have that strategy uh, in place. 
We also should be uh, quicker in moving towards accreditation of all public sector organisations to make sure they have the uh, essential minimum standards uh, in place to be able to respond in a much clearer and more consistent way. Um, so in closing, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope the Deputy First Minister and indeed the uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, for Justice will address these issues uh, head on. Uh, I hope that they have um, uh, listened to my, my genuine concerns about what's happening around our uh, infrastructure, that uh, we end the catalogue of IT failures that I've seen across the public sector, and instead uh, we can focus and make sure these attacks don't happen again. Thank you. I call John Finney to be followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, the motion which we'll support tonight calls on everyone to secure their technology, and uh, I think that's wise advice. Now, with regard to personal security, we all know the steps we, we can take, um, and uh, with regard to that, we'd be given guidance from Police Scotland. Cyber security, most of us know roughly what to do, and the Cabinet Secretary um, uh, for Education um, highlighted some of the, the training that's gone on there to inform, inform future people. I'm concerned about the, the whole uh, IT industry, to be perfectly honest, uh, and say that uh, with regard to certain equipment I had in here, um, I was told it would have to be replaced uh, and because uh, we no longer support older versions. Um, now, um, so it's quite clear that when it comes to IT, others tell us what to do and the price that it's going to cost us, and that's consumerism writ large there. So the analogy with the car that uh, um, my colleague Stuart Stevenson alluded to do doesn't apply because we wouldn't have a situation when they say, as of next year, we'll stop repairing your car and you won't be able to get spare parts for it. And that knocks out the, the standard procedure we would all should go about, and that is then we inspect something, we repair something, and we replace something. Um, I'm told we do. Well, um, if that's the case, then that's a, a further example of consumerism. And the, idea, the fact is that these corporations are holding us to ransom. Um, Cybercrime, as my colleague Lee MacArthur said, is uh, underreported, and it's important that we assess all risks uh, and we put in place mechanisms to ameliorate these risks. And, of course, the risks are known. They're largely known, and many believe the source of the risks which turned into this attack are known too. Specific hacking tools in this attack were developed by the US intelligence agency, the NSA. And we'd have to ask whose interests are served by any action like that. Um, and they were recently leaked by a group thought to be preempting retaliation by the US security services for hacking the Democratic National Committee in the run-up to the presidential election. The plot, perhaps for a, a movie, but it had significant effects. Now, um, a number of people have talked about the NHS being targeted. That isn't the case. And it's important how we, we frame this attack. And they, quite rightly, would there, if they, that is the, the starting point, ask why people would attack a health system. The NHS wasn't attacked. It's the vulnerability in Windows that was targeted. And like many, I would thank the public serv servants who responded so positively to that. So regardless of where people were, this was a global attack. And it's something that will require international co cooperation. Uh, something like this was widely expected. Um, and uh, to quote my colleague Patrick Harvey, uh, he says, resilience of systems need to be thought of more in line with public health rather than acute care. Now, that's a, a health analogy, I think, that uh, bears some uh, relevance. And uh, security services and MOD have no doubt will assure us that they have appropriate protection levels. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Indeed, we heard from uh, um, Stuart Stevenson there that uh, a number of decades ago, Weapons-grade encryption was entirely possible, um, possible where finance was concerned. Yeah. So it's no doubt a big cost associated with that. But we know, we know when uh, a government's prepared to pay, spend over 200 billion replacing a, a weapon system, that money isn't a problem. Um, and as I said, we also know that uh, we need to assess the risks. And I, I would commend a report by the Jimmy Reid Foundation, No Need to Be Afraid. The motion talks about safety, security and prosperity, and uh, that's entirely right. And we know that in liberal democracies across the world, uh, the risks are all the same. The first and foremost one is cyber attack. Secondary ones relate to climate change, access to food and water, um, and then onwards to um, individuals acting uh, alone, none of which Trident would uh, address. So I think it's careful how we frame this debate. We need a free and open internet, and uh, it is the role of government to pre protect its citizens from undue surveillance and such attacks, um, because the surveillance results in state and private sector who use data and metadata to monitor and manipulate citizens. And that has the potential to... Yes, indeed. 
Jamie Green. Thank you uh, for taking the intervention. I, I'm intrigued. Uh, what is the Green Party's position on the government being able to access encrypted data where we know it's been used for terrorist purposes? John Finney. The Green Party is supportive of all reasonable uh, measures to do this. This is about proportionality. The level of surveillance that's being suggested by the UK government and indeed that takes place at the moment doesn't help things at all. We take people with us is how, how we deal with things. But uh, um, it, it has the potential to impact on, on d democratic participation as well. And that is more than just uh, about voting. Now, uh, in the short time uh, I've left, um, I was encouraged to talk about the shadow brokers um, apparently a group of hackers who dumped a set of files, a collection of several alleged NSA hacking tools for Microsoft Windows systems, likely including multiple unknown exploits or zero days. Um, you can see I'm reading this because I don't know much about it. A zero day apparently is a bug that's unknown to the software vendor, or at least it's not patched yet, I meaning it's almost guaranteed to work. Well, you know, we need to have international cooperation and we need to understand the relationship between the expenditure of public money and uh, the IT systems. I'm going to read from our digital rights, our civil rights um, document, which concludes by saying, it should not be left to the Googles and Apples of the world to dictate the future and entice the rest of us to come along for the ride. Government and society must create the space for shared consideration of the challenges and opportunities which lie ahead. Thank you. I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. There's nothing new or surprising about ransomware and the havoc that it can cause to vital data and computer systems. What's probably more worrying is that organisations were caught out by this latest one. Uh, talk to software people and none of them will be surprised at all at the extent or the speed with which it managed to propagate itself around the world. It didn't specifically target our NHS and it only got through to about 1% of their systems, but that was still about 1,500 systems in total that shouldn't have been exposed. The WannaCrypt malware that caused the problem is basically in the same class of ransomware that's been doing the rounds for years, starting with the AIDS Trojan in 1989 that encrypted file names, but not the data itself. Even then, the demand was that a ransom be paid to restore the file name encryption back to normal. This current one was both a Trojan, meaning it masquerades as something else, something recognisable, and it's also a worm that propagates itself around the network, looking for hapless victims without the protection that they need. So a little surprise then that it had such a quick impact and was so widespread. Interestingly, the virus software itself had what's called a kill switch contained within it. This is a simple line of computer code that checks if a web address is registered and can be located on the internet. And if it is, then the virus doesn't activate itself. As I understand it, this is how it was spotted and then stopped. The web address was simply registered and that stopped the virus from further executing. So why did it happen at all? Basically because some computer systems, as members have said, were out of date and not protected from it. It's a wee bit like forgetting to modernise the locks in your doors and windows, and even your alarm systems in your house, when the clever burglar is lurking outside with more sophisticated means than ever before of bypassing them to gain entry. No surprise at all, really, then, that this occurred, and it will occur again, I've no doubt. We have to stop using outdated computer systems that are themselves no longer protected, but still connected to servers and networks. Data critical systems should be upgraded and we must make sure we regularly accept software security patches that are on offer. In fact, I don't think you can turn off Windows 10 security updates, but some experts in the chamber might advise us on that. To protect data itself, experts suggest adopting what they call a 3-2-1 backup strategy. What that means is you should have three copies of all your data, two of which are on local devices but on different mediums, and then one off-site somewhere in case the obvious risk of physical damage or loss of the premises themselves. There is a debate ongoing about the role in this of the National Security Agency in the USA, mentioned by John Finney, who, it's claimed, knew about the malware some time ago but didn't tell Microsoft about it to enable them to fix it. Microsoft had already stopped providing security updates for Windows XP 
around about 2014. And so anybody using XP was increasingly vulnerable. Ironically, then, the NAC themselves were hacked and their data was dumped online, exposing this vulnerability, which was duly exploited by the malware writers. And the result was what happened earlier this month. Clearly, that raises serious questions about data, data security, even within government agencies in the USA, and whether there should be a presumption in favour of protecting systems as soon as a threat is known, or whether it's acceptable to withhold information about cyber attacks in the interests of intelligence gathering. Back here, members may be aware that a year tomorrow, we'll see the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation GDPR mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary coming into effect. I anticipate the Scottish Government's action plan coming next month will embrace this and offer some guidance for all our public sector data users. I'm pleased to note too that the UK Government will be implementing the EU regulation despite their intention to leave the EU itself. Another example perhaps of how we can't really leave the digital single market in Europe. It applies to both data controllers and data processors. And if you're covered by the Data Protection Act, it's likely you'll also be covered by the GDPR. The principles behind the regulation cover things like an individual's right to be informed, rights of access, right to have errors rectified, and the right to have personal data deleted if you request it, sometimes known as the right to be forgotten. And crucially, in the context of today's debate, Article 5 of the reg regulation sets out the requirements in terms of data security. There are clearly many difficult challenges here for all organisations who control and process personal data. From what I can see, any breaches of that regulation could result in potential fines up to €20 million Euro, or 4% of your turnover, whichever happened to be the greater. So, President Officer, data security is increasingly important in the modern world we live in. From lone hackers who may engage in this for mischief to organised international criminals and terrorists who may be financially or politically motivated, the challenges are real and the risks are substantial. Good resourcing, planning, intelligence, vigilance and keeping systems and data up to date and safe are probably our best and only line of defence against the inevitable further attacks that we expect and to control our data that will surely come our way soon. Let's hope we are ready for all of those challenges when they come. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Ash Denham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Digital technology is at the centre of our lives, our society, our economy. Whether it's the new tech startup developing apps in the garages of suburbia, stock markets where money's flying between countries in the blink of an eye, smartphones that we're glued to, or the Internet of Things, with every new breakthrough, it can seem the opportunities are endless. But with opportunities come challenges and threats. The recent WannaCry ransomware attack was the biggest of its kind in history and demonstrated again the need for urgency and vigilance. It hit between two and 300,000 computers in 150 countries around the world. Computers run by groups as varied as Renault, Deutsche Bahn, Telefonica, FedEx, Russia's Interior Ministry, and of course, the NHS across this country. The attacks showed just how digitally interconnected we are, the risks that arise, and how anyone, anywhere, can be a hero or a villain. It was a damaging and cowardly attack, and those responsible must be held to account. But the reasons people hack are various, and there is no one type of cyber criminal. They could be the bored adolescent testing their new skills against security systems. And I saw that in relation to the WannaCry attack, some experts sus suspect a single teenage hacker. They could be organized gangs pursuing fraudulent or illegal deals online. They could be the politically motivated hackers trying to find and leak state secrets. They could be state or commercially sponsored spies trying to grab classified papers. And I saw according to today's Times, North Korea has emerged as a credible suspect for the WannaCry virus. Well, they could be terrorist groups looking to hack at the very fabric of our society. So attacks can be hard to predict, detect, and destroy, which is why cyber resilience is so important. Preparing for attacks, building up firewalls, brick by brick, code by code, withstanding the onslaught when it comes. 
rapidly recovering from an incident and learning from the attacks so they're not repeated. And I note, as Donald Cameron did earlier, Abertay's university's briefing suggesting that we refocus from an overly defensive approach such as cryptography and intrusion prevention to organizations looking much more at offensive cybersecurity. In effect, engaging security agents who think and act like a malicious hacker, utilizing the same tools and techniques. And if that proposition is accepted, then we have a need to train them. And that is worthy of consideration. And I did note with interest that particular university's proposals around a cyber quarter industry cluster in Dundee and also the cabinet secretary's comments earlier on the University of Edinburgh. But who is responsible for keeping us safe and secure online? Well, in a way, we all are, individuals and businesses. But the Royal Society of Edinburgh suggested in 2015 that 30% of Scots lack basic digital skills. And I'd be interested to hear in the government's closing how that will be addressed. According to the Scottish Business Resilience Centre, 42% of Scots use the same password for multiple accounts, and many didn't even change it when they were advised to after a security breach. So as individuals, we can create stronger passwords, update software, install antivirus software, use screen locks on our mobiles, and exercise caution on public Wi-Fi. As for businesses, Liam MacArthur was right to refer earlier to the Association of British Insurers, uh, SME Guide to the Cyber Insurance, which states 74% of businesses say cybersecurity is a high priority, but only 52% of businesses have the basic technical controls outlined in the government's cyber essential scheme. A UK government survey estimated that in 2014, 81% of large corporations and 60% of small businesses suffered a cyber breach with an average cost between 600,000 and 1.15 million for large businesses and 65,000 to 115,000 for SMEs, 66% of which did not consider their businesses to be vulnerable to cyber threats in the first place. And of course, the Scottish and UK governments have a significant role to play, along with the public sector more generally, in leading by example. The Conservative Amendment rightly welcomes that both the UK and Scottish governments have published cybersecurity strategies. As the UK government's recent strategy puts it, we need to defend, deter, and develop our cybersecurity capabilities. We should be factoring in cyber resilience into all new services and encouraging the sharing of information about threats. We should strengthen our critical national infrastructure sectors like energy, transport and the wider economy. Law enforcement has to have the tools to track, apprehend and prosecute cyber criminals and hit back when appropriate. Promoting awareness and education is key. Our tech savvy children and young people should be encouraged to think also about cyber resilience. And we should teach cyber security basics to the pensioner setting up online banking for the first time or Skyping their family overseas. There are economic reasons to develop IT skills, with an estimated 11,000 new IT jobs needed each year to meet current demand, an average median full-time earnings for tech specialists 30% higher than the Scottish average. Deputy Presiding Officer, the events of a fortnight ago showed us the need for vigilance and urgency in protecting ourselves online. And as everything in our daily lives becomes more connected, the challenges are only going to get more complex. Yet there are practical steps that individuals, governments, businesses can take to take the sting out of the tail of attacks and ideally stop them from happening in the first place. And that's why I'll be voting for the motion today. Albeit I'll also vote for the amendments in Jamie Green's name and Claire Baker's name, which rightly add to this debate. Thank you. The last contribution in the open debate is from Hash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We are living in an age where technology is fundamental for individuals, for businesses and the public sector alike. And whether it's communicating with family and friends, accessing information, selling a product or providing social services like healthcare, technology and the vast amounts of data that go with it are everyday components of our society. And because this technology has become so commonplace, it's very easy to overlook the security measures that are so vital to defense against cyber attacks. Because I think it's difficult to picture, digital security isn't as palpable as locking your door against intruders. It doesn't come with the same urgency that one feels for a highly trained police and military force to protect against would-be cyber attackers. But as technologies become the norm, so too have threats from those that would seek to use the technology to inflict damage or harm. 
And that's why, as chair of the National Cyber Resilience Leaders Board, Hugh Aitken, he said, cybersecurity is everyone's business. And we need to ensure that all organizations have appropriate safeguards in place. Indeed, we witnessed this nearly two weeks ago now when NHS computer systems right across the UK were impacted by a cyber attack that reached most corners of the world. Over 200,000 computers across 150 countries were impacted, including some of the biggest businesses, and we've heard already, such as FedEx, Renault and Telefonica. Thankfully, no patient data from Scottish health boards were compromised and quick steps were taken to immediately isolate computer systems affected by the attack. The ransomware that wreaked this global havoc, WannaCry or WannaCrypt as it's sometimes known, was only stopped after a security researcher from Devon found what's known as its kill switch. And the reality is that these types of cyber incidents and attempted cyber attacks will continue. It's no longer sufficient to be merely cyber secure. We must also be cyber resilient. Organizations, businesses, and the public sector must be prepared to respond, to react, and then get up and running again as soon as possible. Debbie Ashenden, a leading cybersecurity professional and academic, she uses the phrase, people and not patches. Obviously, patches do help to close loopholes that malware can exploit, but there's often a vulnerability in the workplace. Employees can sometimes be a target, and turning them into the strongest line of defense is both important and also possible. The WannaCrypt ransomware exploited a vulnerability in the Windows Server Message Block Protocol, but it likely gained entry via a phishing attachment, or so-called social engineering, both of which use deception and are becoming more frequent and more sophisticated. According to data from Wombat Security Technologies, there were 1.2 million of these type of phishing incidents worldwide in 2016, and that's up 65% on the previous year. And that data also found that work-related phishing scams are more successful at getting people to click on them. And as such, decisions that employees make every day can be instrumental for organizational cybersecurity. Organizations can invest in employee education in order to improve this security. Simulation tools, which are short and snappy and include up-to-date current scenarios and then are run multiple times through the year, are ideal for improving employee awareness. Because we all have a shared responsibility to ourselves and our families and in our workplaces to ensure that the right protections are in place on the various technologies that we use. And in fact, as we've heard, that 80% of cybercrime can be prevented by doing basic software updates, particularly for antivirus software, and making regular or even daily system backups. Otherwise, it's like making sure your windows are shut, your, do your door is bolted, or even having a security guard posted outside. But then if you accept an unscheduled parcel delivery while you're distracted by talking on the phone. At the national level, Antivirus vendor silence has shown not so much, or not much, is off limits. Um, it demonstrated that hacking the USA's most popular voting machine, showing tallies could be altered by outside interference. And there maybe then is a need for a type of national shield that would sit on top of existing cybersecurity system and hunt for threat actors, analyze events that are ongoing, and also behaviors, and then it could flag up suspicious activity. A.V. Chesla of MPOW described it as potentially an intelligent layer on top, observing and monitoring, could be part of a defense infrastructure that would also be able to collaborate and then importantly share that information across national boundaries. Following a 16th of May meeting of the National Cyber Resilience Leaders Board here in Scotland, delivery on an action plan to defend against potential cyber attacks in the future in Scotland was accelerated. And this plan will include support for 121 public sector organizations to make sure they get proper training and accreditation needed to fight these ongoing cyber incidents. And the Scottish Government is taking steps to enhance resilience. Things like exercises are being organized for health boards and other agencies so that they're able to learn lessons and mitigate the risks of future incidents. Additionally, the government's refreshed digital strategy, which was published in April, will be supported by 36 million for the Digital Growth Fund over the next three years to help businesses develop cybersecurity, 
data analytics and software engineering skills in their staff. And these positive actions will help towards the government's goal of making Scotland a world leader in cyber resilience, where we approach threats with urgency, keep our data and networks secure, and stay aware of the constant cyber risks, making sure they never outstrip the benefits that technology brings to our society. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call Mary Fee. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In discussing our shared ambitions to make Scotland a safer place online, I want to start by talking about issues that are still very raw and very emotional given the last 48 hours in Manchester. My heart is with the families of the young people whose lives were so cruelly taken with the injured and with the people of Manchester. And the response immediately following the senseless bombings show the care and humanity that remains and will strengthen because we will not give in. And that response came in all forms, as first responders bravely ran into unknown dangers, as emergency services assisted the injures, injured, strangers taking others to safety, and the wider community offering shelter, food and transport. An online communication played a vital role in assisting people and shows how integral it is in our lives. And that is why we must promote safety and security in all our online activities and online communications. And in our increasingly technological world, means of communicating are expanding, and sometimes it seems as almost daily they are expanding, and making our world a much, much smaller place. And the government vision highlights the need for people to be informed and prepared, for businesses and organisations to recognise risk, and for a growing cyber resilient community. No one can argue with that ambition. And we all have a responsibility to protect ourselves. We need to think about our own online security and how many of us use the same or similar passwords when we are online. We shop online more, we order food and drink online, we bank online, we talk and share thoughts and memories. And to many people like myself, this concept brings new opportunities. Online commerce is growing in Scotland and by working with the business community we must ensure that the internet remains a safe place to carry out business. And I won't be, pretend to be as informed as some are about cyber security and cyber resilience. However, reading through the Scottish Government's strategy to prevent and tackle cyber attacks, I see a lot of very positive ambition. And I do believe that to continue to prevent further attacks and promote online safety, we must place a much greater emphasis on education. The internet will continue to play a major part in our society and teaching young people at school is a preventative step for generations to come. And as for our ageing and vulnerable population, we rightly promote online access to the internet. However, that must go hand in hand with online safety and with the right support and help to allow them to access the internet. And countries across the world need to respond to the increased risk of cyber attack. We need a global response to ensure that we are all safe. And as Claire Baker pointed out, much of what we are talking about in relation to cyber security can sound a foreign language to the public and to some politicians. And the recent ransomware attack has brought the issue to light and has raised awareness of the threat that hackers can pose. Our public services need to have the resources available to ensure further attacks do not bring down computer systems and affect service users. And following the statement in Parliament last week and again today, and as Sarwar has raised concerns and warned of the dangers for the NHS, highlighting freedom of information requests and parliamentary questions asked by my former colleague, Dr. Richard Simpson. Questions dating back to 2010, and the government response has been less than satisfactory, and action is needed and needed now. And the evolving nature of online crime changes year on year. And although the government has produced a very positive and very ambitious strategy, it is vital that this strategy is updated every year and that this chamber is kept informed of the level of risk and attack our public bodies face. 
And, presiding officer, this has been a very timely, consensual and constructive debate, with agreement from across the Chamber of the need to improve our online safety. And, presiding officer, we must work with the rest of the UK on this issue. That is why a future Labour government would include cyber warfare and cyber security as part of a complete strategic defence and security review. And it's vital that our cyber security forms an integral part of our defence and security strategy. And a Labour government would introduce a cyber security charter for companies working with the Ministry of Defence. And turning to the debate, several speakers highlighted the role that education can play. Jamie Green spoke of the global impact of the latest attack. And Stuart Stevenson, in his own inimitable way, spoke of human, fa human failings across the century. And Liam MacArthur spoke of cyber crime. And, presiding officer, Scottish Labour's amendment to the government motion speaks of the importance of investing in our public services to ensure they are safe and secure across their networks. Local authority budgets are under pressure. However, the government should assure, ensure that local authorities are supported to develop and maintain cyber security across all our public bodies. And similarly, third sector organisations and businesses will benefit from a collaborative approach. The Scottish Government's aim is to create a cyber resilient Scotland, and we will work with them to do that. We will be supporting the Government motion tonight and the Tory amendment, and I hope that the Government will support our amendment. Thank you. I call Dean Lockhart up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, we've had an interesting debate today with a wide range of issues discussed. Uh, we've also heard some remarkable data about the central role of the digital world in every aspect of our life uh, nowadays. Let me add a, a couple of other data points to this. In a business context, uh, the contribution of the digital economy in the UK is now over £1 billion per year. In a global context, there are over 1.3 billion daily active users of Facebook, including, I'm sure, many members in this chamber. And closer to home, in the UK, we spend more time on media and communications than we do sleeping. And I'm sure that's something that members in this chamber will also recognize. We've also heard that when things do go wrong, a cyber attack can have a massive impact. As the recent attack on the NHS highlighted, and let me add my commendations, to the remarkable response of the NHS, first to the cyber attack two weeks ago, and now to the ongoing tragic events in Manchester. Given our growing dependence on online technology and the risks we face, we welcome today's cross-party support for the need to increase cyber resilience in Scotland. We will be supporting the government uh, motion and Labour's amendment this evening. Uh, I want to pick up three points that were raised during the debate. First, what do we mean by cyber resilience. Second, what are the key risks that we need to address in this increasingly digital world? And finally, what steps can be taken to maximise uh, cyber resilience in Scotland? Uh, turning to what does cyber resilience mean, because it, it's not necessarily clear to, to everyone what this might mean, John Swinney and Jamie Green highlighted uh, in their opening remarks that the, the concept of cyber resilience stretches far beyond what we might consider to be cyber security. It's not just about having a firewall or downloading a new patch to prevent viruses getting through. Cyber resilience involves a whole range of other measures. It's about preparing for and defending against attacks or accidental system failures. And it's about being ready to rapidly recover from these events and having contingency plans in place. Cyber resilience is particularly important for large organizations which may cause systemic risks if they are attacked. For example, the NHS or large banks. For these organizations, cyber resilience is about having a whole system approach to cyber risk. For these large organizations, um, the World Economic Forum has set out a list of cyber resilience measures that they recommend that organizations that may have a systemic risk uh, should implement. First of all, they should have the very latest operating systems and platforms in use. As we saw with the attack on the NHS, if you don't have the up-to-date systems in place, the virus can very easily uh, spread. Secondly, having contingency plans in place ready to activate if there is a systems failure. And I would commend everyone involved in the NHS for the rapid response 
to the recent cyber attack in terms of getting the system back up and running. It also means better digital training for everyone in the organisation. A recent report by the Royal Society of Edinburgh indicated that 30% of the Scottish population lacks basic digital skills. As Liam Kerr said, this is something that we do need to address. And these organisations, the large organisations that may cause systemic risk, also need to develop a culture of awareness of what cyber risk may look like. Cyber attacks very often focus on the weakest link in an organisation. And we've heard that can very often be individuals opening emails perhaps that uh, are addressed to them, but which allows an entry point for the cyber attack. And we've heard that human weakness in the area of encryption has been a common factor throughout history. Uh, I didn't expect to be referring to Mary Queen of Scots today or Napoleon on a debate on cyber, but uh, Mr. Stevenson made sure that uh, we had a bit of historical uh, context within which to view the topics today. For smaller organisations uh, who may not have the scale or budget for some of the measures I've uh, set out uh, as recommended by the, the World Economic Forum, they can still take important steps as explained by Willie Coffey. Keeping software updated as far as possible, external backup of data, installing antivirus software, using strong passwords, as well as staff training and raising awareness. There is also, I think, a role to be played by the enterprise agencies in providing support and training in cyber resilience. And this is something that we would recommend in phase two of the enterprise and skills review. We should consider um, putting some policy measures in place that the enterprise agencies uh, prioritise cyber resilience as part of their portfolio. Presiding officer, we have to recognise that all of these additional measures will involve significant investment across public and private sectors, but the risks and costs of neglecting cyber resilience is significantly higher. We saw this, we saw graphic examples of this, uh, as Donald Cameron said, in the context of the um, attack on the NHS uh, 10 days ago. But attacks are also increasing in the private sector. According to the British Chambers of Commerce, one in five British firms was hit by a cyber attack last year. And just a quarter of firms in the UK think they have adequate security measures in place to protect themselves. This uh, cost of cyber crime is estimated by the Scottish Business Resilience Centre to be around £394 million last year. And on a UK-wide basis, this figure is a staggering £11 billion. So given all of this, given the cost of what can go wrong if we don't have the necessary protections in place, we believe, as our uh, uh, amendment to the motion sets out, that additional steps, additional investment, additional education and awareness of cyber resilience is necessary. Deputy Presiding Officer, let me conclude by considering briefly what steps can be taken going forward to maximise Scotland's cyber resilience. And again, our amendment sets out some of these steps. We support the Scottish Government's current cyber security plans, but we would like to see specific proposals in response to the recent cyber attacks brought before this Parliament for debate. We also want to see closer collaboration with the UK Government and the new National Cyber Security Centre. This includes active participation with the UK-wide industrial strategy as a platform to expand our skills base in the digital sector, something we've heard that the UK government is investing over £2 billion to increase our skills base and develop our digital technology across the UK. Finally, as I raised with the Cabinet Secretary, we also want to see action taken to increase the number of STEM teachers across Scotland, including an increase in the number of teachers who are qualified to teach computing skills. This will be critical to enable future generations to deal with the increasingly complex digital world. Thank you, and I move the amendment in Jamie Green's name. Are you telling me that Mr Green didn't do that already? You did? Well, that's moved twice. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure. <laughs> I call Michael Matheson to close this debate up to nine minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'm uh, very grateful for the contributions that have been made here this afternoon uh, by members, many of which have been very valuable contributions, raising a range of uh, very notable and uh, interesting points that uh, deserve further uh, consideration. Can I say, President Officer, we'll be accepting both the amendments which are proposed uh, here 
uh, this afternoon and the tone and the nature of the debate has demonstrated a real genuine interest in making sure that in Scotland we do as much as we can in order to enhance and improve our cyber security as a country. There is no doubt, President Officer, that the digital revolution has the potential to enhance everyone's life in uh, Scotland. However, it's also vital that our security uh, and our economy uh, that we have uh, and the way in which we use uh, the digital technology for the running of essential services and in supporting our critical infrastructure as a country, uh, that we do so with a system which is safe, secure and that it is also importantly uh, resilient. But, President Officer, no one in this chamber should be under any illusion about the threat that we face from cyber attacks and the enormous challenge that Scotland, the UK, that uh, countries across the world actually face uh, from cyber attacks. And uh, we all, importantly, whether it be the public sector, the private sector, or the voluntary sector, uh, we all uh, have an important role to play in tackling the issue of cyber security and in making sure that we see it as a shared responsibility uh, in order to deal with the threats which we face online. That's something which no government alone, Scottish government, UK government, or even the European Union alone can actually uh, tackle. And it's something which we all have to accept that as a collective responsibility on our part uh, to work collaboratively in order to address the risks associated with cyber security. So, officer, this was an issue which was highlighted by Jamie Green in his contribution about the importance of collaboration and working in partnership uh, in order to tackle the issue of uh, cyber security. And that's something which we as a government take very seriously and was set out in the strategy which was published by the Deputy First Minister back in November 2015. And a key part of that is not only about bringing together uh, governments, whether it be Scottish Government and the uh, UK Government, whether it's bringing together the work that we do as a government with the uh, new uh, National Cyber Security Centre, but it's also about bringing together all of those different parts of our sector who have a part to play in delivering on cyber security. That is the public sector, the private sector, and the voluntary sector. There is no point in us taking forward a particular approach within the public sector and also having robust systems in place if we don't share that understanding and that expertise with the private sector. Equally, in the private sector where they have expertise as well, how we can harness that and utilise that within our public sector and in our voluntary sector are equally important. And that's the approach that we as a government are determined to take forward. I'll give way to Mr Green. Jamie Green. Uh, I, I don't disagree. Uh, uh, thank you for taking the mention. I don't disagree with anything uh, you said there. Uh, sorry, the, the member said. Um, how in practice would that work, this collaboration between the public sector in terms of its own IT investment and the, the private sector and vice versa? So what are the means for collaboration in that respect? Michael Matheson. No, sir, this is a very issue which I was uh, going to come on to, and that is why we created and the Deputy First Minister created the National Cyber Resilience Leaders Board. Uh, chaired by the uh, Chief Executive of CBI Scotland that has the voluntary sector there, it's got the public sector there, and it's got the private sector. Uh, various organisations all working in a collaborative fashion in order to learn from one another and to support one another in tackling some of the issues around cyber security. And Scotland is the only part of the UK that has that structure in place in order to make sure that we have that collaboration. And no doubt that uh, the experience we've had with that over uh, the last few weeks in helping to support us with the cyber attack that we recently faced, I think is a lesson that could be utilised in other parts of the UK, uh, in which we would be more than happy to share our experience with the UK government and the benefits that could come from that. I want to turn to some of the specific issues which have been raised uh, and to also address some of the myths that have been peddled in the course of this debate, uh, particularly the issue about this was an attack on NHS. This was not an attack on the National Health Service. Uh, as was illustrated by Jamie Green uh, and by others, is that 150 countries, more than 150 countries, were affected by this cyber security attack. It was public sector organisations, let me just make this point, public sector organisations, private sector organisations in different parts of the world which were affected by that uh, as well. 
So we have to recognise that this is not something which is about simply in the public sector, we're not doing enough. It is about the increasing complexity and the challenges which we face with cyber security. Because the reality is that many of our public bodies, NHS and others, public sector company, uh, private sector companies are facing security attacks on a daily basis uh, through cybercrime. And I'll give way to Claire Baker. Claire, Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. Um, I do fully accept the point this wasn't an attack on the NHS. And if uh, that suggested in the comments made by myself that was, um, that was due to time limitation, I think, in explaining the whole situation. However, the fact that the NHS were affected by a global attack, I think, did expose some weaknesses within our public sector that need to be addressed. Michael Matheson. Absolutely, uh, which is very important that we recognise the effect it actually had on some parts of our NHS. And there are clear lessons to be learned there. The reality is that the NHS in Wales was affected by it. I was participating in the COBRA meetings to discuss this issue and the Welsh Government were represented because of some of the challenges they were faced with it. There's no doubt the NHS in England were more adversely affected uh, than any other part of the NHS within the UK. If you look at our own individual boards here, there were two of our biggest boards that weren't affected by it, but we then had some of our other boards that were affected by it in a, in a very limited, to a limited degree, and then there were other boards who were affected by it to a greater degree as well. We have to understand why, as, why was that the case? Why were some of our NHS boards in Scotland not affected by it at all? Some who were only affected by it on a limited basis and others in a greater level. And that's one of the important things. Well, let me make the point at first, if you don't mind, is that that's why the important measures that were taken forward through the National Leadership Board that we've established will actually be doing a lessons learned exercise, an exercise that will involve NHS Scotland, the wider public sector in Scotland, the private sector in Scotland, and it will also involve the third sector in Scotland. And fortunately, we've also had the benefit of the expertise from KPMG, who have offered to host that particular event so that we can make sure that we learn as much as we can from this particular type of attack on this matter. I don't recall the member being here for the debate, but I want to make progress uh, on the points that were raised. Uh, can I also make the uh, point when members were making, raising the issue around cybercrime? Because cybercrime is an important issue and it is a growing issue and the complexity of it is growing as well because the reality is the organisations who are behind cybercrime are not individuals just operating from their own bedroom. These are sophisticated, seriously organised crime groups who are operating using multi-million pound systems in order to perpetrate cyber attacks. And that's why, as a country, we need to make sure that we work in a collaborative fashion. I have the benefit of having the insight that's provided through the, uh, the EC3 programme run by Europol, working in a collaborative fashion right across Europe in order to tackle the issue of cybercrime. And it's absolutely crucial that we maintain and that we protect that partnership in tackling cybercrime because we know it's underreported and that it is also a growing issue. And that's why, in moving forward with 2026, we also need to make sure that we have a workforce within the police service that is able to respond to these types of issues effectively as well. So, officer, in drawing my remarks to a close, there have been many very valuable points which have been raised in the course of this debate, which I've no doubt this, the, Deputy, uh, the, the Deputy First Minister will take away and give consideration uh, to as we move forward in looking at how we can improve uh, the way in which we deliver cyber security in this country. But key to that, is to recognise that we all, as individuals, have a part to play in how we operate our own computer-based systems. The companies that we know as well, the roles that they can play and the role that the public sector can play in tackling cybercrime. And the work that we will take forward with the strategy is determined to make sure that we do that here in Scotland. Thank you. That concludes our debate on building a cyber resilient Scotland. The next item of business is consideration of motion 5765 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 5765. Moved. Thank you very much. No member has asked to speak against the motion. The question is that we agree motion 5765. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The next item is consideration of motion 5766 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a timetable for the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill at Stage 1. 
I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 5766. Moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 5766 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And the next item of business is consideration of two motions on the approval of SSIs, I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 5639 and 5768. Moved together. Thank you very much. We come to decision time. There are five questions. The first question is that amendment 5733.1 in the name of Jamie Green, which seeks to amend motion 5733 in the name of John Swinney on safe, secure and prosperous achieving a cyber resilient Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 5733.2 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of John Swinney be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 5733 in the name of John Swinney as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 5639 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we agreed? And the final question is that motion 5768 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We now move on to members' business in the name of Finlay Carson. I will just take a few moments for members to change seats.